countdown to the last comic shop in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hey, it is now time for more of the last comic shop! That's right. We are opening the shop, maybe growing it, maybe shrinking it. Depends on where the shop is located this week for newbies, helping them find their way underneath the big comic book tent and avoid the bug zapper in the corner. And we're keeping the lights on for that. Ah! Ah, there's ants. Turn the lights off. Turn the lights off. That's right. We're not having any picnic on this week's show. We're bringing you more comic book reviews. I'm the host of The Most, Andy Larson. I'm joined by Chad Smith and Jay Scott. And, of course, we're talking about Ant-Man, given the new Ant-Man movie is out in theaters now. And we went and saw it. But guess what? You gotta wait till the end of the show or you can just fast forward. Whatever you want to do. But long story short, we're not getting to our movie review of Ant-Man Quantumania till way, way later in the show. I know one thing. The movie is called Ant-Man and Wasp Quantumania. I'm trying to steal Janet's thunder. Oh, man. But the comic we're talking about man. came out uh, last year in celebration of Ant-Man's 60th anniversary. And it is called... Ant-Man. All right. Well, who did it, Chad? Who was involved with this project? It was Al Ewing and Tom Riley and Jordi Belair on colors, along with VCs Corey Pettit on letters. Very cool. All right, J.A., you're in charge of that 10 cent synopsis. Keep it short, like Ant-Man, tiny, for this four-part miniseries. Well, the four-part miniseries, each issue essentially talks about a Ant-Man, I guess, an Ant-Man, uh, and there's four of them. So you get the Scott Lang Ant-Man, you get Hank Pym Ant-Man, you get the Eric O'Grady Ant-Man, and then you get this Ant-Man from the future who is trying to collect all the Ant-Men together so they can battle Ultron Ant-Man, Hank Pym Ant-Man. So and it's his name it's, is Zane Asgard. Try saying that five times fast and you've been drinking. <laughs> so the first three issues sort of set up the whole last issue. You know, they get big, they get small, they get big. They use this aging ray to fight a all-father-powered Ultron. Yes. And in fact, that was actually my favorite part of this four-part series was at the beginning of issue four, Al Ewing just gets to make up a lot of history. He just, like, gets to make up, like... All these issues that didn't happen. <laughs> and just put them down on paper like the mighty Thor 4774. <laughs> so he just gets to like make this future of the Marvel Universe where all these events unfold where Ultron gets the powers of the All Father and then enslaves the Earth and a Doom bot manages to save everything. In the immortal Doom colon the end, Omega. <laughs> Hashtag Omega. Now it's it, it, I sincerely love those three pages. Why? Because it's like every other comic book we've ever read, in which they just try to jam down your throat all this continuity that you may or may not be aware of, but in fact you don't need to be aware of because it's all made. <laughs> yeah, and it was kind of it was kind of nice. It was a bookend to the first issue, which was the original Hank Pym, and it was always linking back to all these. You know, oh, as seen in Tales of Astonish, number 51. Yes. For a real true Marvel fan, it felt like a real Marvel comic. Like, I don't know how much DC fans are slaves to the continuity, but I know that me, as a Marvel fan, 616 continuity is sacrosanct. Like, it is important. We need to know that this is a continuing story and a continuing narrative. So, like, the fact that they spent some time actually filling in the blanks up to this future Ant-Man, I loved it. I could have used a whole book of just Al Ewing just doing that. Just I know. And don't forget, he's using his superpower of hindsight <laughs> to include Eric O'Grady and Scott Lang in the early adventures of Hank Pym. Absolutely. And so, I mean, I think I'll continue with my initial thoughts of this particular book. I really did enjoy it. But that's simply because, honestly, I'm kind of a fan of Ant-Man. I may be part of the minority of folks, but I kind of like Ant-Man as a character. He's that Avenger that's not Captain America or Thor or Iron Man. You get to play around with him. And the fact that he's been both like a good guy and a bad guy, gets shat on sometimes, that he's had to pull himself back from... 
I don't know. I think there's a lot of depth to all of the various incarnations of Ant-Man. He's kind of a loser. Like, he's the loser <laughs> Avenger. And guess what? We're all losers. So I can, hey. like, I can relate to that in some ways. Chad, what did you think? So, no, I, I enjoyed this. I thought as a 60th anniversary celebration, this was great. They're just touching on all the notes, and the story itself wasn't too serious. It celebrated some of the kooky, campy aspects of his old rogues gallery. And the best part is, I don't know if those are real rogues or not. I don't care. <laughs> Ant-Man is one of those C-list characters that I feel like writers can take and mold to however they want to do it. And particularly as a huge Paul Rudd fan. Once that ethos took over, like, oh, we're going to give Ant-Man the Paul Rudd charm just with that down-on-the-luck, uh, ne'er-do-well uh, situation there. That really appealed to me. So that I've loved Scott Lang since then. Uh, most of the books he's been in since then have been you know, up my alley. And it's that sense of humor and playfulness. And writers aren't afraid to to have fun with you know so many characters once they get so big there's nothing that can happen in their stories and people take it all way too seriously ant-man's always had that sense of whimsy about it and i thought that was definitely at play here throughout the course of the series so it's back within some of the gaps like as much as i liked eric o'grady i didn't realize black ant was a clone of eric o'grady yeah yeah that was kind of so neat i learned something because once again ant-man see this character not something i'm going to pay attention to all the time so yeah good times Jay, right. what about you? Where are you coming from on this one? I thought it was all right. As a 60th anniversary, I could have used a little bit of his other alter egos, like some more giant man or that costume from the 70s that looked like he was straight out of uh, <laughs> some sort of strip bar. Wow. Yeah, that, uh, what, yellow jacket or, or another one? Well, not the Goliath. That was yeah, the Goliath oh, wait. was Clint. Clint got oh. his, his pim particles and he decided not to wear a shirt. <laughs> okay, so there you go. Thinking, I was thinking Goliath. Yeah, okay. no, it's fair. It's fair for those folks. They may not know that that wasn't Hank. That was Clint deciding to show off his machismo because <laughs> he was like, I, I don't have any superpowers. So evidently, I'll take pim particles and become the new growing guy. Right. But there was no giant man in here for the most part. So you, you're spot on on that critique. So I think like everyone else, Ant-Man is a bit of a, a cipher, maybe. It's dependent on what the writer wants to do with him. He doesn't seem to have his own personality. I always found Hank Pym to be more interesting as like the the scientist who always gets things messed up, builds Ultron, and, and almost destroys the world with his brilliance because he has this need to fix things where there probably didn't need things to be fixed. I mean, but that's the thing. Like the one thing I've always loved about Hank Pym, cause you brought it up is the fact that like he embodies like what could have happened to Reed Richards or Tony Stark had they had a really bad day. I don't know. One of their things went wrong, right? Reed Richards creates things that could have gone wrong all the time. Like he could have created Ultron very easily. And been like, yeah, all the blame for this horrible AI that can't be killed and comes back and tries to destroy the world all the time. That could be on his doorstep. It could be on Tony Stark's doorstep. No, it was thrown on Hank Pym's doorstep. And unfortunately, he's just like, well, I got to deal with it. And, and it kind of feeds into his inferiority complex when, in fact, it really shouldn't because they could have been as boneheaded as he was. What do you think? I, I mean, his power is becoming small right or becoming big <laughs> admittedly when you're a giant man you can hit things and you know you put some weight behind it but the whole like you're small but then you have the power of the ant so you can lift 10 times your strength or something I, it's it's kooky and i think <laughs> that that's that's the issue that no pun intended that the writers have sometimes is he's saddled with this like 1940s golden age power set Honey, I shrunk the kids' power set. You don't think that's an interesting power set or, like, a useful one at all? I I, I, I don't know. I guess it's useful if you've got to clean, out, wishful clean out the go. dust in your keyboard. <laughs> I, well, I'll, I'll throw it out to you. Like, you wake up tomorrow, J.A., you already have shrinking. Are you going to be like, oh, damn it. Like, why did I get this power? I couldn't get twice. Yes, yes I'm, I'm short as it is. I don't need to get any smaller. <laughs> 
what do you say, Chad? You got shrinking tomorrow. Would you take advantage of it or what? No, I, if if I have shrinking and the guy next to me has the multi bajillion dollar super suit that can fly and shoot laser rays, and I'm like, I can get tiny. Like as far as wish fulfillment goes, like that's the worst. <laughs> Who wants to be the guy that's like, yeah, I can really, you know, get into the cracks of things. That's where I want to go, right into those cracks and solve them. No, but it's in terms of like usefulness, and like Jay said, it's it's a kooky power, and so they they have to come up with kooky antagonists. They have to come up with uh, silly scenarios, and as long as you're acting in good faith with that man and having fun with it, I think it's a great character. And I, I actually, I lean the opposite side, where I'm more Scott Lang, Eric O'Grady. Like, I prefer the screw-up Ant-Mans. You know, like, Hank Pym's always been too serious for me. Yeah, he doesn't embrace his screw-up side. Yes. He's just as much of a screw-up as the rest of them. Because that's the one thing they all have in common. They're all screw-ups. Yeah. Just that Hank Pym tries to pretend like he's not. And it's just hey, like, he's no. got yeah, a superiority complex because he built the suit and he came up with the pim particles. They're all just using it, right? And even I think in this issue, uh, is it issue three or issue two, where is Eric O'Grady is like, I ran out of pim particles. So he's trying to like grave rob, hoping that <laughs> Scott Lang has been buried in his suit so he can get some more pim particles. I got to say that was of, of all four issues. That was like my favorite segment of all of this was when Eric O'Grady was trying to... to <laughs> you know, there's nobody buried there. Like, his body was atomized. Like, there's nobody there. And, like, tied it into Secret Invasion because that's, like, the Skrull version of Hank Pym. And, like, and love got, I love it. He's like, the worker ants are, are working, and it's, like, ten minutes later, oh, I thought you guys would be a lot faster than this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I, I guess, uh, you know, in, in con con continuing with this conversation about Ant-Man, I've kind of uh, addressed the fact that I enjoy the character of Ant-Man. Chad's kind of said, like, he likes to screw up. Jay, do you like the character of Ant-Man? Or are you just, other than this, I don't think you've read any other Ant-Man. So, like, what is, what's your take? Didn't we read an Ant-Man with the bear? We did, but that was on the old show. Oh, okay. So you did read uh, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't have picked this up if I didn't have to read it for the show. That being said, it was okay. Uh, Ant-Man, you know, take him or leave him. He's a page filler on the Avengers for me. Wow! That's a big statement, man! Yeah, what about All, Fa All Father Ultron? Was that That was pretty cool. That was cool. Would you like to have seen him go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Silver Surfer? What I would have liked to see is the story of All-Father Ultron taking over Asgard and fighting all the, the Asgardians and the Doombots. And the, I mean, the backstory for that was more interesting than the four issues. I wanted to find out what happened to the Doombot and how did the Doombot survive <laughs> and then become, like, you know, a, a golden Doombot to make new Doombots based on the old Doom. You know, it's, yeah. that was interesting. Ant-Man, it, it, again, it, it's sort of like, okay, it's a guy that shrinks and grows. Uh, I, I, before we get to our ratings, last thing I wanted to ask was uh, about the art. Tom Riley is uh, kind of a hot new freshness, I think. Uh, he did that Thing series, which was pretty acclaimed uh, last year. And uh, honestly, I, I just absolutely loved his work on this particular book, especially his Silver Age stuff in issue one. Uh, where he gets to, you know, really flex his muscles and draw that classic Silver Age Hank Pym and the classic Ant-Man costume. Uh, it kind of reminded me of uh, Age of Century series, which I really loved back in the day that uh, Jeff Parker wrote. Anytime people can kind of ape that uh, Silver Age style, man, I just, I just love it. What do you think, Jay? Yeah, I thought it was good. I really liked the first issue because it, you know, sort of felt like it was... Silver Age, Golden Age storytelling. And then as you progressed forward into the future, uh, the style, I thought, you know, helped change and, and mimic that a bit. And especially the the future Ant-Man had a sort of black Spider-Man suit going on where you don't have any uh, definition to the muscles. It's just one black silhouette. It's sleek, baby. Oh, yeah. It's sleek. All right. What did you think of the art, Chad? I, I loved it. And I loved, too, the, the subtle nuances. Like, I think Tom Riley is one of those artists, and he's part of that, that style that I really enjoy. I go back to people like uh, 
Pablo Rivera or Marcos Martin, where it's sort of it's one of those styles that straddles the modern age and the classic Silver Age comics. But uh, especially in this series, you had more of the Silver Age tinges in issue one. You get to issue two, and the irredeemable Ant Man with Eric O'Grady was drawn by Phil Hester and uh, Andy Parks, and you can definitely see notes of that art style seeping through. But at the same time, you recognize the homages, but it feels like the same artist throughout. So even though he's doing those little tweaks, those little, you know, fine motor things, it's the 2% of the audience that recognizes it can appreciate it. And the folks that, that might not see it, it's not going to detract from it because it's not so jarring from issue to issue that it seems like it's totally different people. And I think that's that's a really tough thing to do well. And so... Uh, it's fun. I, I, I love it. And I, I do think some of those flashback pictures are my, they're my favorite parts. Like seeing, Oh, like that looks like Mike Allred a little bit. When he's yeah. Doing, uh, Future foundation, Ant-Man. And like, there was a lot of fun to be had in the series. They are right. included. Well, let's see if there's a lot of fun to be had in our ratings. Cause we got to get to our movie review coming up here soon. So Jay, what's our one out of four scale? Well, this was all about ant men. An Ant-Man book about Ant-Men, so how many Ant-Men do you have? Ah, you like that uh, shrinking sound effect there? Just for you, J.A. It, it comes in handy sometimes. Chad, we'll go with you first. How many Ant-Men are you giving this book? Okay, I had a lot of fun with this book. I read the, the four issues, and I, I don't have many complaints. With that said, would I put this on, you know, the best of the best lists? I don't know if it cracks that spot, but that's apropos of an Ant-Man series. 3.25. Okay. I'll go next, and I'll say this is a solid uh, 2.75. If you haven't read any Ant-Man, though, I'd give it probably like a 3.5, just simply because I think this is a really good book that if you've gone to the movie and you don't really know a lot about Ant-Man, but you want to pick up a book and be entertained for four issues and learn a little bit more about the history of the folks that have worn the suit uh, and then can go back and find in buck bins, you know, some issues of the Nick Spencer Ant-Man series with, you know, the Scott Lang Ant-Man, or you go again back to that Eric O'Grady series and Irredeemable Ant-Man. I think this is kind of a little bit of a buffet that you can taste some stuff. So from that perspective, it's a great book. For anybody that doesn't read Ant-Man. As somebody that's read a lot of Ant-Man, though, it's like a 2.75. It's enjoyable. Is it the best Ant-Man ever? No. Dick Spencer's Ant-Man is really hard to beat. Uh, and so I've, I've read really, really good Ant-Man in my day. This is a nice little horse divorce. Bring people through the door so that, that they can then try some other entrees. Uh, so, J.A., what's your rating? Yeah, I'm going to split the difference and give it a three. I think it's a solid book. It's a nice uh, celebration of Ant-Man, nice compact four-issue story for the 60th anniversary. I think it's interesting that I found his partners to be much more interesting than him. So, you know, Janet Van Dyne's Wasp or Cassie Lang's Stinger, they were the more interesting of the characters than actual Ant-Man, which actually um, they're putting out a Wasp series that sort of mimics the Ant-Man series. And I'll talk about that in the recommendations. I'm actually really looking forward to that. Sort of the cover design is very similar with different Wasps, I assume. But it's just, it's a three. It's solid. It's interesting. It gets you in. You don't need to have a lot of knowledge of his entire backstory to appreciate the, the book. And you do get sort of the, you know, Hank Pym destroying the world because he's got issues. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. And then saving it because of those issues. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll get to talk about that a little bit more in, after the commercial break. When we get to recommendations, J.A. talked about that Wasp book. And I think, again, I have some reasons why Hank Pym's is messed up as he is. Stay tuned for more of that right after these messages. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. We are Cheap Seat Reviews, the podcast that explores the Hollywood film industry for the greater good. The greater good. Join us each week as we dive into the depths of streaming movies. 
for the greater good. The greater good. You can find us on Twitter at Cheap Seat Cast, Facebook.com slash Cheap Seat Reviews, and our website is CheapSeatReviews.Libsyn.com. All for the greater good. How can this be for the greater good? The greater good. Shut it! Hi, everyone. I'm Nick Palatichuk. I'm an independent film director and screenwriter. I'm also an independent comic book artist and creator. I want to let you know about my podcast, The St. Paul Filmcast. It's a weekly podcast where I interview other independent filmmakers and other artists from the Twin Cities area. You can find the show on Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, and Amazon Radio, as well as our distributor, Podbean. You can follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. So, if you're interested in how independent films get made, or the process of filmmaking. Also, if you're interested in other artists' process and works as well, tune into my show, The St. Paul Filmcast, where it's not over till the guests say it's over. back with more of the last comic shop and it is now time for recommendations that time of every single show where we make you wait longer to get to a movie review because we want to talk about other comic books that you should pick up at your local comic book shop in addition to the four issue ant-man series that was recently wrapped up so we'll go ahead and start off with j.a scott who had already teased his in the previous segment Yes, that's right. I am recommending the Wasp miniseries that is currently being produced. It's, again, also by Al Ewing and Tom Riley and Cassia Nia. But it's very similar to uh, the Ant-Man, sort of you're going through Janet Van Dyne's life. And what I'm really hoping for is we get a lot of 80s Janet Van Dyne where she was super rich and had like a penthouse <laughs> that she let that she let She-Hulk stay in. Yeah, I, I do like 80s Wasp a lot when she was leading the Avengers and they gave her something to do. Actually, yeah. well, somebody was talking about her the other day is like the proto feminist character. Like she was the one that was always thirsty against all for all the guys in the Avengers and like wasn't hiding it. And yeah, she was. She was super thirsty. She <laughs> was like, I want a tall glass of Thor right now yeah, yeah. <laughs> with a double of Steve Rogers on top of that. Thanks. It's like probably uh, she talks to him. Hank. If you can shrink and grow things, can you just do that to certain parts of your body? <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, there is that one up issue of Avengers, which is probably the most disturbing sex scene of all time, <laughs> where they're in Vegas together, and you just see this little tiny Hank Pym come up from underneath the the sheets, <laughs> and you're like, no, oh, oh no, <laughs> that would be a full body workout. Right oh, there. that's rough. Well, I will say this, that uh, I feel always that one of the major reasons why Hank Pym was as messed up as he was, was because Janet was so thirsty. You want to talk about feeding somebody's inferiority complex when she's like, oh, look at the muscles on Thor. Well, you know, I can become huge. Look at me, hot stuff. She's a modern woman. She is. Always has been. She is. I do love the Wasp, too. Honestly, <laughs> she's one of my favorite characters. In any case, Chad, uh, what is your recommendation this week? Okay, so I am going to similarly recommend something we alluded to. And since I'm going before you, I'm going to beat you to it. Oh. I'm going to go with the Nick Spencer run on the Astonishing Ant. Damn it! That was good. Oh, now i got to look through my box and find something else. Uh, go on. I know. So, Eddie, this, this started around 2015, which is a wonderful time for Marvel. So many great books came out of that 2015 year. And then uh, issues one through five ran, and they had an annual, and then they restarted it, and it ran for 13 more issues. All of it is collected in the Astonishing Ant-Man, the complete collection. And in there, you get Nick Spencer at Nick Spencer's best, uh, writing about a screw-up Scott Lang, who is trying to get custody of his daughter back and repair his relationship with his... uh, ex-wife uh so you have the divorced ex-con who's constantly screwing things up and tries to set up his own 
security agency and is accompanied by a couple of D-list characters. Is it uh, Machine Smith and then not the bear. Grizzly. What's his name? Grizzly. Grizzly's there and uh, uh, there's one or two more. The wi- Not Wizard. Yeah, and it's the first time she hooks up with uh, what? What? Uh, Janice Lincoln. They have uh, the booty call in one uh, of those issues. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, Tombstone's daughter. Yep, 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 yep. And you, you get the debut of the hen chap, which I think shows up here in this series. Just like this series that we read this week, The Ant-Man by Al Ewing was a great primer if you want to get into the character. If you want to love the Scott Lang, the, in particular that Paul Rudd version of Scott Lang, who's just, just the lovable screw-up, you couldn't do better than this book. And then the art is fantastic. It's Ramon Rosanas for a lot of the art throughout the book. But it, I don't think they let you down throughout the, the course of the series. And so it's Dick Spencer. Tons of fun. Lots of laughs. Lots of charm. The Astonishing Ant-Man, the complete collection is out there. Uh, it's just uh, shy of 500 pages, and it is worth picking up. Oh, yeah. there's And so there's some really good issues. You find out about, like, the secret laboratory inside the pin helmet. Yeah. And uh, there's, like, a giant man shows up for an issue. Like They get the a new giant man. Yeah, the new giant man, which was kind of cool. Damn it. I wanted to recommend that. All right. Well, I, while Chad was talking, I was uh, looking through my box. And uh, this week, I'm going to recommend uh, not the smallest hero in the uh, Marvel Universe, but two of the biggest. We're talking about the Incredible Hulk and the ever-loving Blue-Eyed Thing. And back in the 80s, Jim Starlin, who we had the pleasure of interviewing on the last comic shop. Make sure that you check that out in our archive section, lastcomicshoppodcast.com. <laughs> Basically, Jim Starlin wrote a graphic novel as part of that graphic novel series that's very acclaimed and, and, you know, has things like, you know, God Loves Man Kills and um, uh, The New Mutants and, oh gosh, so many more. But uh, he wrote one uh, called The Big Change, and it basically teams the Incredible Hulk up with the Thing, and they get uh, transported away to an alien planet. And have to uh, go on kind of like this, like midnight run, kind of you know, cop buddy adventure across the planet to basically shake down this interplanetary gangster who stole like a food additive or whatever. Regardless, it's got interesting, you know, funny segments where you know things trying to fit in. He puts on a trench coat to try to disguise himself, and you know, Hulk grabs an octopus guy and puts it on his head. <laughs> As his disguise, <laughs> so this octopus starts talking, and I, I don't know. It's 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 fun to see Jim Starlin be humorous and, and crack jokes. And again, when you've got that team up of like the Thing and the Hulk, kind of like almost like a sibling sibling rivalry uh, between the two as the two big bruisers of the Marvel universe. Uh, it just makes for a wonderful read. But the last reason that you should check this out, and maybe I should have led with it is the fact that the art is done by the late, great Bernie Wrightson. If you've never uh, seen any of Bernie Wrightson's Swamp Thing or Bernie Wrightson's uh, Frankenstein or any of the other fantastic work that Bernie Wrightson has done, this guy knows how to draw monsters. And when you're talking about monsters in the Marvel Universe, there's no better than the Hulk and the Thing. And to bring that humanity to those two uh, and that gorgeous, gorgeous art uh, is just the, the whipped cream and the cherry on top of the Sunday. It, it just makes for a great trade. So if you can find it in a comic book shop near you, go searching through those back issues. See if you can find uh, the big change graphics novel line Marvel put out in the 80s. That Hulk thing, does that is that the panel where they're arm wrestling or is that from a different book i think that's the movie over the top <laughs> yeah there's like a scene where hulk's in like a track yeah, i just want to know if thing if thing turns his cat backwards <laughs> <laughs> well one thing that office. we don't we hope that you don't turn backwards is any episodes of the last comic shop i don't know how you would do that maybe just put them in reverse and listen to them <laughs> kind of like revolution number nine you start spinning the disc backwards i don't know but regardless, don't do that. Just listen to them the way that we intended, which is from the beginning to the end. Don't skip any parts. 
especially with our movie review episodes. I know you were waiting for that movie review. We'll get to it in just a second. But make sure that you're subscribing. Going out to www.lastcomicshoppodcast. Uh, you know, leaving us a nice review or rating or what have you. Or just, again, just listening to the future shows. Because that's all we're really asking from you is really just to listen. Because we want to talk comic books with you and make you as big of a fan as we are. And if you want to continue with the conversation, you can catch us on the socials at Last Comic Shop. We are on the Twitters, we're on the Instagrams, we're on the YouTubes, where you can find things like our weekly polls Jay puts out, or Golden Age covers to put you to bed at night, or just fun comics conversation. Uh, and you need to go back to the home base to find all that stuff, you can go to www.lastcomicshoppodcast where they can find what else, J.A.? Now you have a link to our merch store where, if you go right now, you can see our sweet St. Paddy's Day t-shirt. Go for the green Heather. Everything is better with Heather. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is better with Heather. My goodness. <laughs> I wonder I wonder if Janet Van Dyne is, is better with the Heather. Can I? I don't know, but <laughs> I know. she would look great in a St. Paddy's Day t-shirt, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's something to be seen. We're hoping that folks do buy that St. Patty's Day shirt because we're so proud of that design that, man, like if it sells, we're going to keep it up on the site long after St. Patty's Day comes and goes because I just think that you just got to see it for yourself, folks. It's just something wonderful. There you go. And while we love our Heathers, we also love our local comic shops. We're the last comic shop podcast you need. But we want you to go out and support your stores. So you can find cool things like Ant-Man miniseries. You can find cool things on the shelves right now, like that Wasp miniseries by uh, Al Ewing and Company. You can go back and find the Astonishing Ant-Man complete collection or the trades. Uh, they're all great. Or if you want to go deeper into the archives, you can find the Hulk and the Thing in... The big change? The big change. The That's big right. Change. They're going through the big change. All right. Hey, <laughs> we've all gone through it. Or are going through it. Who knows? They're like, they're like Blanche on the Golden Girls. Okay? <laughs> Yeah! Anyways, yeah, make sure you go out to your local comic book shop, pick up those issues, and make sure that you stay tuned. Because right after this sweet little interlude, you might get something. Maybe something that you've been waiting for for a long time. Until then, though, I'm the host of The Most, Andy Larson. I was joined by Chad Smith and J.A. Scott. And we hope that you stay safe, stay tuned, and don't turn our damn show off. Because if you know anything, there's stuff after this music. But don't be dumb. It's like the post credit sequence. You know it's coming. Just sit there and eat the rest of your old popcorn. Paul Rudd's going to be okay. I hope Paul Rudd's going to be okay. Of course he's going to be okay. It's true. He's very handsome. He's, he's always going to be okay. He's ageless. Oh timeless. God. Hey, it's Mikey Wood, frequent Last Comic Shop guest and collector. And as a collector, I'm always in need of boards, bags, long boxes, and more to house all those comics. That's why I use promo code LCSPOD to get 10% off my orders at bcwsupplies.com. Not only does it get me a discount on BCW's already low prices, but I know using LCSPOD at checkout is another way I can show my support to the Last Comic Shop podcast and their continuing mission to bring fans together under that big comic book tent. So if you're in need of comic book supplies, head out to bcwsupplies.com and use promo code LCSPOD. L-C-S-P-O-D today. That's L-C-S-P-O-D. And we are back. Thanks to our man Mikey for those messages. And we are ready to review what is for me personally my most anticipated Marvel uh, Cinematic Movie of the year because I am just, I'm a huge Paul Rudd fan. And these Ant-Man movies... Boy, have they been Paul Rudd showcases, just showcasing the charm and the laughter and just, oh, everything that's wonderful that is uh, encompassed in that thing that is Paul Rudd. And so we are here today, and it is finally time to review Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania. Yeah. I didn't realize that Ant-Man is in the middle of Quantum Mania. Yes, Did you... I didn't get that until the end with yeah, the Yeah, I was just like, was really? Like, oh, that was, oh that look was at cool. that. That's cute. Yeah, what a nice visual effect. <laughs> so, before we get into all the visual effects, why don't we start with the who's it's? And, uh, Jay, can you tell us who was in charge of Ant-Man and the Wasp? 
Quantumania. Okay, so this was directed by Peyton Reed on a screenplay, if you can call it that, from Jeff Loveness. As mentioned, the ageless Paul Rudd stars as the Ant-Man. Evangeline Lilly was in it, I guess. She plays the Wasp. Um, new to the series, played by a different actress than who was in Endgame, Catherine Newton played Cassie Lang. Uh, you had Jonathan Majors doing his best to chew the scenery as Kang the Conqueror. Michael Douglas and Michelle Pfeiffer played Janet and Hank, and were probably, for me, probably some of the best parts of the movie. Bill Murray shows up to cash a paycheck, and then you get some other people here and there playing Gee, bad guys good or good place. guys. Who did he play? He was the guy whose forehead glowed. Oh, see, I never watched that show, so oh, well, that's a good one. Ran- Randall Park had a little cameo where he's trying to do the credit card thing. Corey Stoll in a cameo role as... as uh, oh, wait, wait, pa- let me hit the pause button here. And just for those that may not be aware, there will be spoilers starting almost immediately. <laughs> so go ahead, Jay. Who was Corey Stoll in the film? So he was in the first Ant-Man movie where he's Darren Cross, the yellow jacket. He got smashed into a little thing, uh, went down apparently into the quantum realm and has been reinvented by Kang and saved and turned into MODOK. So yeah, if you guys are MODOK fans, like Andy is a big MODOK fan. I am. He's fun. Anytime you can play with MODOK, he's a big giant head with baby legs and baby arms. And he has like a ridiculous personality. Like, I, I don't know. He's straight up Bronze Age for me and all the campiness that is good 70s Bronze Age comics. Yeah, that was a genuine surprise for me. I thought Bill Murray had been cast as MODOK. Oh, yeah. And so I. I kept waiting for a giant Bill Murray hat, but no, it was, it was Darren. <laughs> if we're going to get into it, I'm going to say, yeah, Bill Murray, no point to be in the movie besides to cash a paycheck. I didn't need to have that mental image of him having sex with Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> there you go. Well, there's a lot of things this movie didn't need, and we'll get to that. But first, Andy's going to help us out. Jay, he gave us the who's it's. Andy, give us the what's it's in the form of a 10 cent synopsis. Okay. Again, there's going to be spoilers here, but just in case you haven't seen it, I mean, it's the third in this trilogy of Ant Man movies dealing with the adventures of the Pym family heading down to the quantum realm and yada, yada, yada. This time around, it seems like Scott Lang doesn't really want to do much adventuring anymore because he's writing books and just walking around the street saying, like, hey, look at how cool I am. And, and, and I guess joy in the, the good life. Unfortunately, his daughter, Cassie Lang, is kind of more reckless, kind of has a little bit of her father in, in her in terms of wanting to right the wrongs and stand up for the little guy and break laws. And I don't know. But long story short, she builds this device that allows them to navigate the quantum realm or communicate with the quantum realm. Whatever. But long story short, it's a big beacon for Kang the Conqueror who's been stuck there. Uh, as you may or may not know, Kang is the big baddie of this movie, and he's been exiled by the rest of the Council of Kangs to the quantum realm because it's outside time and space. And he's been stuck there, and he worked with Michelle Pfeiffer when she was stuck there, tried to escape, and then Michelle found out how bad he was and was like, later Felicia, and that was that was pretty much it. So now they're back there, and they've got to fight Kang. And a lot of ants show up. And that's the 10 cent synopsis. I will start by saying that I really did like this movie. I'm not going to say that it was the best MCU movie of all time. It's not even probably in the top 10, but it's definitely not in the bottom 10. I can probably think of like 10 MCU movies that I hated. And this isn't even in that that ballpark. I thought this was fun, goofy sci-fi I mean, it's it's sad that they they took all this talent and they put them in basically what what amounted to a, a, a cartoon episode. So, yeah, but I didn't mind it as a cartoon. Like I was just like, oh, this is just that cheap melodrama. It's like you got the big bad, you got the pe- he kidnapped everybody to get back his thing. And yeah, like, it was. It, it's like like episode five of the Flash conquers the universe. But who cares? It had some cool visuals and, and I enjoyed it. But that's neither here nor there because evidently I don't know if my co-hosts enjoyed this. We'll start off with J.A. because I didn't see the movie with him, and I'm curious to hear what he thought. It kind of reminds me of Cotton Candy. (laughs) It was big and colorful 
and strangely produced. And how does sugar turn into this weird, wispy, withery, willowy confection that you get to eat? And then you eat it and it gets gooey all over you. And then you wash your hands and, and it's like you haven't eaten anything. But you've got a little bit of a sugar high and about half an hour later you feel, ooh, maybe I need to eat some hot dogs or something else. Because that cotton candy gave me a bit of a sugar rush. And that's basically what this movie was. It was fun while it was lasting. And then it's over and you're like, that was it? That, that was the story? There's no story. Th- huh? The creature effects were great. The build of the quantum realm was fun and exciting to look at. But in terms of a story and a movie that meant anything, yeah, not not not, not really there. Uh, as I said, uh, if Michelle Pfeiffer had not been in this movie, th- there wouldn't be much to watch. I mean, Paul Rudd's Paul Rudd. He he he's not bad. He's cute. He's fun. Paul Rudd is a delight, sir. <laughs> yes. Sorry. yes. You sir. didn't like yes. Jonathan Majors as Kang. I- I thought, I thought he, he was a lot of pathos as a bad guy. I thought he he chewed a lot of scenery. Uh, <laughs> he he did what he needed to do. He, he walked around posing a lot. He's an interesting bad guy. I'm glad that obviously they can't just kill him off. And I'm interested to see what they do with him as the character. But in terms of the, the movie plot, it's a lot of retread. It's like you know bits of Star Wars, bits of Dune, bits of old Marvel movies. You you they haven't changed it up enough that. You knew what all the hits were going to be. You knew where they were going to go low and they were going to peak here and they're going to do a little soul searching moment here and a crying moment here. And oh, has it been five minutes? We need a quip. Where's the quip? It wasn't bad. It wasn't great. Was it worth the money to go see it in the movie theater? Yeah, probably. Will I ever watch it again? Probably not, even if it's on Disney Plus. And I guess we'll talk about this later, about the whole future of the MCU. Maybe I'm just burned out. It's it's like the cotton candy. I have a bit of a, a sugar crash after all this MCU <laughs> stuff. little tummy ache. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I did see the movie with Chad, and I, I, I kind of sort of know what he's going to say. But, Chad, what did you think of this movie you were highly anticipating seeing? Going back to Jay, you said it, it wasn't bad, it wasn't good, it was just there. No, this was bad, Jay. This was a boring movie. And I, I love the first two Ant-Man movies. Like, they had their own little niche in the MCU where they were, pardon the pun, a little bit smaller. You know, they relied on the charms of Paul Rudd. Uh, but they were fun. They were, you know, they were silly. Uh, you had Luis and all, you know, the, the gang and all that other stuff. And they had a heart to them. This movie had a ton of wonderful pieces to play with. Like, I think Jonathan Majors as Kang is an awesome bad guy. Boy, I wish he would have done something. All he did here was stand around and talk about whatever the MacGuffin was and about how all the other Kangs are mean to him. They they didn't use Paul Rudd to his advantage. They had Bill Murray. They didn't even use Bill Murray for anything. And... I'm just so mad because the Ant-Man movies, they were the part of the Marvel Universe that had that little chunk of heart. So much so they took Paul Rudd's Ant-Man character and put him into the big event movies as like, hey, here's the human connection. You know, here's this guy that's the everyman. And he got to carry that load. He got to be the hero in Endgame. But in here, they plopped him in a dollar store Star Wars movie. And if I wanted to watch a bad Star Wars movie, I would watch any of the motherfucking Star Wars movies that have happened in the last decade. I don't need to go and see that from Ant-Man. It was so disappointing after the, the promise of the first two movies to come and see this, where it was just them in a CGI fest. It's the cantina scene from Star Wars extended out. None of the characters showed any growth. Nothing changed from the beginning to the end of the movie. And the best part about the movie was freaking Darren Cross's Modoc. When Darren Cross is the best part of your movie, and you have Paul Rudd over there, and you have Bill Murray over there, and you have Sharon Stone over there. Uh, Sharon Michelle Stone. Pfeiffer. Whatever. Michelle Pfeiffer. It doesn't even matter. <laughs> You're doing it wrong, man. You're doing it wrong. Oh, boy. It, it, did, it did feel like it was a, a two-and-a-half-hour movie to set up the next big thing as opposed to be a movie by itself. It was I like, did. I'm watching two-and-a-half hours of setup. 
Well, I'm going to come in and I'm going to defend this movie a little bit because, I again, I did really enjoy it. I thought that it was super cool to see Hank Pym and his huge army of ants. Like that end scene where they they're the Deo Ex Machina. And was it was it cool? It was cool because like, Hank Pym is one of the giants of the Marvel universe in terms of intellect. Like he's up there with Tony Stark and he's up there with Reed Richards in terms of his ability to invent really cool things. And I thought that for once, you know, that was on full display. He basically, uh, you know, created this, you know, his own society of ants. He let them run wild, and in the end, they came back to help their creator, and that was cool. Good for you, Michael Douglas. He's the super genius guy. How nonsensical was it that uh, Kathleen Turner never told him (laughs) about what was going on (laughs) in the quantum realm? And he, the super inquisitive super genius, never inquired to ask what was going on down there? Well, in the she's time been since gone she's for like 30 years. He was just glad he was having regular sex again. Like, he's, it's fine. Like, I, if you were having sex with Michelle Pfeiffer, I'd be like, I don't care what you have to say. Just, just I'm glad you're back. It, it was such a glaring pothole. And I mean, Marion Cotillard from uh, Indiana Jones was doing a great job <laughs> in her role. But they really just didn't make sense at all. So I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the fact that... Um, Paul Rudd kind of had a little bit of an arc. I'm not going to say it was as good as the other movies, but he had kind of this arc of like being this character that really didn't care. I've done my Avengering. I'm just going to soak up the praise of being an Avenger. And at the end of the day, he had to realize that like Cassie believed in him, that people were counting on him and that he had to take down the bad guy. That's right. And the Spinal Tap drummer that is Cassie Lang, who gets replaced in every movie. Like, oh, we need another Timmy. Uh, she did a great job. She was a, a great plucky sidekick in the whole adventure. Uh, but boy, would it have been nice had anything mattered and she was more than just the damsel in distress? Well, I will say this, that my my biggest qualm or, or problem with the movie was, was actually the end. I didn't like the fact that like Cassie opens up the portal and brings Hope and Scott Lang back to the regular universe. I think that the movie would have been better if Hope would have come to, you know, Ant-Man's rescue and then Ant-Man and Wasp just spent their time in the quantum realm and their story was kind of like over. Or that would have been at least some consequences. There were no consequences at the beginning. The the movie starts and ends. We're at the same point. Nothing, nothing changed. Right. And, 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 And you have Cassie who has come into her own as a superhero during the process of this movie. That's her arc. She gets to be the Ant-Man going forward or Ant you know, ant person, you know, she gets to carry on and and know that her, her dad sacrificed himself so that she could get back and, and carry on that fine tradition. I just think that would have been a better story. Uh, Cause at the end of the day, all they did was go back and he ate some bad cake. And I was like, I didn't, I didn't need that. I, I thought, it, and plus he would have had those cool stories in the Sabatonica place, which I, I, I loved. I love the guy with the holes and he was made out of jelly. That was cute. I like the guy with the with the cannon for a head. That was all neat. Like it hey, was it was really cool when Sarah Cotter was there and it's like, oh wait, yeah, she's badass. Yeah, Everybody's yeah, gonna be yeah. afraid of her. <laughs> I'm running out of 80s. Dangles. I know, I know. Well we're Simple gonna get Shepherd. the ratings before you run out of because we're running out of show. <laughs> so anyways, Jay, what's your one out of four scale for this week? I guess one out of four kangs. Okay. Fair enough. Since yeah. there were a lot of them at the end, I mean, that was another thing they held out to. Who is the person that has put Kang in this place? Well, it was himself. Yeah. Other people. Because, that was you know, great. Oh, you were Kang really gonna be Kang. That. I was! There was Ramatot and the Scarlet Centurion. It had to be Scarlet Centurion. He didn't look exactly like the Scarlet Centurion, but whatever. And there was a Mortis! And they're awesome! Whoopity do! I like Fat it. Kang in a little jacket. Oh, yeah. there's. <laughs> Mickey Mouse there's, Kang. There's oh. there's Egypt Kang and China Kang and it is like the it's the Epcot of Kangs. <laughs> well, I'm gonna give this three Kangs. I think I'm gonna give this a solid three Kangs. Uh, at the end of the day, again, it's not the worst MCU movie out there. Could it have been better? Absolutely. But did I enjoy this movie more than like Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness? Yeah, I actually did. I also enjoyed this movie more than Eternals. And that's a low bar. Yeah, well, it, I, I enjoyed this movie better than Iron Man 2 or Iron Man 3 or, oh, oh I don't know, 
a bunch of other movies. I like the plucky sidekick boy from Iron Man 3. That's a good film. <laughs> I think that deserves a second shot. And again, like Iron Man 2, this is just a movie that sets up other movies, which is fine by me because, again, I don't see any of these MCU movies as nothing more than one continuous long television series that I'm just watching pieced out in the theater one by one by one. So, yeah, this was a pretty good episode. Move the full plot forward and we got a new big bad who I think has the propensity to be better than even Thanos believe it or not, if played right. J.A.? Yeah, I mean, if you're going with that analogy that it's sort of like the MCU's become comic books, this is the Atlantis attacks of uh, the MCU. It's a two. It's a two and a half, maybe, uh, because Michelle Pfeiffer. And see, I'm, I'm, I'm like perfectly in the middle between the two of you. I like the stuff that you liked. I like the world building. I like the characters. I like the sort of Star Wars-y cantina scene aspect of the quantum realm. But on the same time, on Chad's side of things, what's the story? There's no development. With I mean, they're all, you know, they're competent actors. They're trying to do good work, but the script is just drag. <laughs> All the people that worked on it were mostly visual effects people, but there was only one script writer. So maybe they needed some more script writers. <laughs> I'm over it. I got a stomach ache. I'm going to go lay down for a little bit. All right, Chad. It's worse than a stomach ache for me, buddy. <laughs> I was so excited about this one. I love Paul Rudd. He's a delight. Like the Eternals, we could kind of sniff that out. Like, oh, that's not going to be very good. Like, you saw that one coming. This was just heartbreaking because it committed the worst crime a movie could make, especially one with so much talent behind it. It was boring. And I was going to come up with a food analogy, too. Every year we go uh, camping, and there's a, a restaurant where we go uh, called the Cooksburg Cafe, and they have all these different kinds of ice cream. But there's one kind that's called Crazy Vanilla, and it has all these high contrast swirling colors to it but at the end of the day it's just vanilla that's all this movie was they had all these beautiful graphics they had these weird little aliens that are asking oh how many holes do you have ha 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 that's fun but uh, at the end of the day it was all just vanilla and it makes me so sad because i genuinely thought the ant-man movies were something special this was not and it was just wasting talent and potential whether it was uh michelle pfeiffer yeah i know it was michelle pfeiffer the whole time uh, whether it was Cheaty from The Good Place, whose name I don't know yet, but I'm sure if he's in more stuff, I'll figure it out. <laughs> but, you know, for me, this is the Thor 2, where it's like, oh, they have all this great stuff in there, but boy, it, it did not come together in the least. And if this is what Kevin Feige and company are going to bring moving forward, uh, with recent reports about how Bob Iger is going to start trimming down the Marvel catalog, this is fat you could have trimmed. And I'm saying that about a Paul Rudd project, and I love Paul Rudd. This gets... One out of four Kangs. Out of respect for Paul Rudd. That's it. This is bad. All right. Well, we hope that you go out and watch uh, Ant-Man and Wasp Quantumania. No, or, or not. <laughs> it depends on what you want to do. But we, we hope that either our ratings, yay or nay, didn't stop you from going to see it, if that's what you want to do. It's still in theaters now. In any case, make sure that you're tuning in next week. We've got a great interview with Dennis Culver. Uh, who's writing the upcoming uh, Unstoppable Doom Patrol book. So make sure that you're tuning in to The Last Comic Shop for that. Until next week, I was the host of the most, Andy Larson. I was joined by Chad Smith, Jay Scott, and yes, this is truly the end of this episode. Yeah, no magic. No magic tricks in this one. <laughs> Apropos for this was moving. No you're magic. so harsh. People worked on this. A lot of people. <laughs> Way too many people. Paul Rudd, I'll give you my money. Oh, don't do this to me, Paul Rudd. Don't do this to me. was a 2023 Black Angus production.